Sometimes in life, you are in the wrong place at the wrong moment. And sometimes in life, you're lucky because you're at the right place at the right moment. And that moment of luck happened to me when I was in Tibet in 1997. I was traveling as a backpacker, and the first person I met in the backpacker lodge was Sabria. And Sabria was traveling by herself as a blind young woman from Germany all the way to Tibet. And I was wondering, why would somebody who's blind going to Tibet? It's not for sightseeing, is it? So I asked her what she was doing, and she had this dream about starting up a school for the blind. And I said, that interests me. And she fascinated me, and so we said, OK, let's do this together. So about nine months later, she called me up, and she said, I'm leaving for Tibet next week. And I decided to quit my job and join Sabria the next day. So we started up the first school for the blind in Tibet, and we faced lots and lots of challenges. We thought that if you want to do something good in the world, that you have many, many people that will help you and support you. But the opposite was true. We got a lot of obstacles. And one of the major problems, however, we faced was getting a future for these blind kids. In Tibet, if you're born blind, it's seen as something you've done as a punishment for something you've done wrong in your past life. So a lot of blind kids are left out of society. They are left in dark rooms to die. And there's no big you know, like future for them. So Sabria, in her first trip, she met one boy. His name was Tenzin. And Tenzin said to Sabria, oh, you're blind. I'm blind too. And he said it with such a smile on his face that Sabria was wondering, how can this boy be so happy because all the other kids that I saw were like vegetables? So she says, what, did, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm the yak herder in the village. And here's a very simple recipe for life. He had a task that gave him value because he was valuable. He had dignity. And because he had dignity, he got respect. And he could develop self-confidence. So these are the building stones. So we wanted to start this school or this training center for the blind so to give these kids confidence for the future so that they could go back into society and reintegrate themselves or self-integrate. The big challenge we had was when these kids came in, a lot of them, they were never asked, how are you? So how could we give them hope for the future? And we both believe that a wonderful thing in life is to dream. And it's a very important thing because everything we have today started with the dream of someone. So we asked these kids, Back then, they were like four, five, six years old. We started a little dream factory. And we said, we want you to dream about what it is that you want to do. Not what it is what your parents want you to do, your brothers and sisters, or anyone else. It's not their life. It's yours. And you have to, also for you, you are now at a point in your life where you have to make decisions of what it is that you're going to do in life. And I think one of the most important questions in life to answer is, what do I want. Otherwise, you know, you've got to work for about 40 years now. And if you don't do something that you love doing, you become one of the thank God it's Friday people. You know them, right? On Friday, big smile on their face, weekend. On Saturday, less smile, one day left. On Sunday, no more smile. On Monday morning, ah. So we asked our kids and we said, okay, please, you know, dream of what it is that you want to do. We gave them one week time. And after one week, there's Norbu, and Norbu at the time was eight years old. And he says, I want to become a taxi driver. Of course, he's blind. So we could have done two things. We could have told him he's a silly boy, or we could have said, wonderful. We chose for the latter. So we said, wonderful. Two years later, we asked him again, what about the status of your dream? And he said, well, now I realize the fact that I am blind, it might not be so safe to become a taxi driver. But I can set up a taxi company and run it. So that's what it's empowerment. So we started a school for the blind, a vocational training center for the blind with agriculture, market gardening, kitchen management, knitting, carpet weaving. I'm from Holland, so we had some cheese production. I'm a son of a baker, a bakery. So we had a lot of stuff that was never done with blind people. And we set it up in not four, but six years. And then we thought, what can we do with this experience that we've now gotten? How can we spread this to make a bigger impact in the world? We zoomed out from our beautiful planet, and we saw a planet, this beautiful planet of ours, with many, many challenges and problems. And if you turn on the news at night, the newsreader says, good evening, 
every night. And then in the next 10 minutes, you find out that it's not a good evening, is it? So the problem here is you don't see people going out on the streets after the news protesting against the fact that we have all these problems on our planet, right? You don't see anyone going outside, but we should. But why is that? I think it is because we're all distracted by Hollywood, Bollywood, and advertisement. Right after the news, you see advertisement of a lot of stuff which you don't need, but people convince you to have. A few years ago, we were speaking in St. Gallen at a symposium, and the funny thing was reading the newspaper, and the newspaper was full of negative and bad news. And the last page gave us hope. It was a big advertisement of McDonald's. On the left side, it was the Big Mac. And underneath it said, we can't make it better. And on the right side, only bigger. So it was a 140% sized Big Mac. And that's, of course, that solves all the problems in the world. People go to McDonald's and they forget about what the real world is, what is happening. So I think what is required is a paradigm shift in how we measure success. Unfortunately, success or the return of investment is measured in one dimension, and what is that? Money. So I always use an example, and I read this in a book somewhere. There's two people that are in a big argument. One person says to the other one, I'm 100% sure that up in space, there's very advanced and intelligent life. The other guy says, how can you be 100% sure? We've never met them. The other guy says, exactly. So they came and they parked their spaceship on the side of the planet. And they looked what we were doing on this beautiful planet of ours. They were scratching their head because they looked at the equator level and they saw poor people digging in the earth to collect bits and pieces of gold. And this gold was then brought together and melted together into bars. But these bars would not stay there because they went to the northern hemisphere and they were put, and now it comes, this is, this is success, they were put in the ground in the safe. <laughs> and that's what we're all working at. So I think the paradigm shift that is required to create a better tomorrow is that we have to rethink how we measure the return of investment. And I think that we're at a tipping point that the return of investment should be measured in a social change or social impact. On one side, it's the social impact of people starting, of starting to find solutions for social issues. But on the other side, it's also about how we build our world. And that's, I mean, physically build our world, buildings that we have. I think we have to rethink because, of course, there is climate change. 50% of the carbon dioxide that has been produced on our planet is linked directly or indirectly to construction. 50%. And how are we constructing? If you look at the terrible buildings that are built these days, it's horrible. Especially in developing countries, there's so much rubbish of buildings. This building is very, very old, and it will last for hopefully another thousand years. The buildings that are built nowadays are not designed to last a thousand years because it's short-term thinking. It's about making money. Again, about collecting more gold to put in the ground in the safe. So we have to rethink of what materials we use. We have to work with local materials. The measurement of success, people that are newly rich, they want to show off with what they have. So we have friends of ours, and they live across the lake in Kerala, and they renovated their house. And we were asked to come and visit them for the housewarming party, and then they very proudly showed their bathroom. And they were pointing at the tiles, and they said, look, our tiles, they're from Italy. Now, we were in Italy just a few days ago, and there were some friends of ours, and they showed us their bathroom, and they were very proud, and they said, look, our tiles from India. <laughs> this is what we're doing. We're carrying stuff. It's just tiles. We're carrying them halfway around the world. There's no, there's no you know, need for that. So we have to look at local building materials. We have to look at how we use resources in a better way. We are like, there is a lack of energy in this planet. And we have one resource that, well, we treat it in a very bad and negative way. Have you ever thought about how much money we spend on what we put in our mouth? Food. We spend a lot of money on that. 
And every day, and this is very human, all of us, we have to, well, get rid of some. So we go to the toilet. And what comes out, we treat like shit. But it's a resource. It's not waste. So there is a movement that's called Ecosan. And Ecosan, what it does, it splits the liquids from the solids. And we are designed, whoever did this, but they made a design where it comes out separate. But when we go to the toilet, we put it all in one pot. And that's a wrong thing to do. Because if you mix it, it's going to be very hard to clean your water afterwards. So what you can do, you can split the liquids from the solids. The liquids you collect in a separate tank, and then you use that as fertilizer for your trees. The solids go into biogas. It's a very simple thing. Another thing what I looked at is, if you look at the construction materials we have, still we use a lot of concrete. Concrete is a terrible, terrible substance because there's a very high carbon dioxide offset. So we have to rethink of how we build buildings. And when I was a little kid, I learned, I, I worked one summer long and I made some money. And with that, I bought a technical Lego helicopter. And that was a fantastic kit because the next day when I was bored playing with the helicopter, I made a car out of it. And the next day when I was bored, I made something else out of it. So I believe, and I think this is a challenge also for you, wherever you're going to work in the future, that we have to rethink how we construct things and how we build. And we should look at modular systems. Imagine there's a family, man, woman, they move in, they have a small little house, and then they get kids, they can't stay in that house, they have to move out to a bigger apartment. And that's a huge movement worldwide that's happening every single day. So can you imagine now that we have a building block that's about this size, that's a universal building block. So they build their first floor and they live in this house. When kids come in, the second floor, they just add some building blocks, just like Lego. And then when their kids move out, they take away these blocks from the second floor and say, here, build your house. Take it wherever you want to go. I think these are small little things where we can think of how we can change things. Um, a lot of stuff is glued, welded, and you know, put together in such a way that the only way to get it apart is to destruct the whole stuff. Why don't we learn to put things together or to design in such a way that we can unscrew everything at the end and reuse the same stuff anywhere else in the world? Because that's the way to move forward. We have limited resources. If we all want to live the lifestyle that people in America have, and that's unfortunately you know, the, the, the big dream of many people in the world, then we need five planets. We only have one. So we have to find solutions. So Sabri and I, when we started our institute in south of India, it's called Kantari, we had our own dream factory. And we said, how are we going to create this, this campus? So we didn't start drawing. We first start, started to think about how can we create it in such a way that it becomes very eco-friendly, that it's low cost, it still looks good. And so we came up with a long wish list. And people said to us, you guys are crazy because you will never be able to build this. The campus is there, and I would like to have uh, a look that you can see what we built.
So the campus was once a dream, and it became reality. That was definitely not an easy thing to do. But one thing what we learned is, if you have big dreams, the bigger they are, the better. And if you have a clarity of what it is that you want, it just requires a lot of hard work to get things done. I think all of you are looking now of what it is that you want to do in life. And I think that's a question that you have to give some time. Because it's the most important, in my opinion, it's the most important question in your life. Do something that you're passionate about. Trying to find your passion. Everything else will follow. Success, you know, you're going to get paid for something. If you are passionate about something, everything is possible. If you want to change the world, that's also possible. People will tell you, well, maybe your ideas are too big, you're too small, you should not grab for the stars, you should not dream. But now you can tell them, just bite into a Cantari, the small chili, and you can see that the small chili can make a huge difference. Thank you very much.